transforming pollution from the burning of fossil fuels. Biomass can also produce renewable liquid fuels, allowing American consumers, desperate for energy independence, the ability to power their cars with cellulosic fuels from middle America rather than oil from the Middle East. Wind turbines are sprouting on farms and ranches, generating clean electricity while continuing the land's traditional use for food production. These practices are already growing uh, clean energy jobs and generating new revenue in our rural communities. With the right energy and climate policies, American farmers and foresters will play a crucial role in curbing the dangerous buildup of global warming pollution while creating new sources of income. Money can grow on trees after all. The witnesses before us will help the select committee understand the challenges and opportunities Global Warming presents to U.S. agriculture and forestry. I look forward to their testimony. Let me now turn and recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing gives the Select Committee the opportunity to explore the impacts that proposed climate legislation will have on the agriculture industry and the effect that it will have on consumers. The House Democratic leadership has spent the last two months rushing to pass a carbon emissions reduction scheme that I call cap and tax. I call it cap and tax because the legislation is a hidden energy tax that will increase the price of nearly every staple in American life, including electricity, goods and services, and gasoline. Today's hearing will allow us to explore how this flawed policy will hurt American farmers. Cap and tax will reduce the security of America's food supply. If the government mandates a cap on fossil fuel emissions, many utilities will switch from coal to natural gas to generate electricity because natural gas produces fewer CO2 emissions. As demand for natural gas rises, the price will rise as well. But natural gas isn't used solely for electricity. As Ford West, president of the Fertilizer Institute, says in his written testimony, there is no substitute for natural gas in nitrogen production. The U.S. domestic nitrogen fertilizer industry supplied about 85 percent of America's nitrogen in the 1990s, but the high cost of natural gas has moved much of this production and its jobs overseas. Today, just 55 percent of this vital farming resource is made in the United States. Much of the imported nitrogen is made in places that offer cheap natural gas like the Middle East, China, Russia, and Venezuela. These countries have no restrictive po climate policies like cap and tax, and their energy efficiency is generally lower than that in the United States. Mr. West cites a study by the Doan Advisory Services that shows that a cap and tax scheme would add six to twelve billion dollars in additional costs for farmers by 2020. <coughs> a recent study by the Heritage Foundation on the Democrats' cap and tax proposal also shows the devastating effects this scheme will have on agriculture. Farmers will be forced to pay more, and those costs will be reflected in the price of nearly every agricultural product. The Heritage study shows that increases in costs are expected to reduce farmers' incomes by $8 <coughs> billion in 2012 and by more than $50 billion in 2035. The average net income loss between 2010 and 2035 is projected to be $23 billion. With numbers like these, it isn't surprising that 37 food and agriculture groups have opposed the cap and tax legislation. In addition to expanding taxes, cap and tax will expand the government, especially the Environmental Protection Agency. Because enforcement is a true of a true carbon cap would debilitate the U.S. economy, the legislative proposal currently before the House of Representatives allows covered entities to make substantial portions of their reduction outside the cap, though through what are called offsets. The bill allows two billion tons of offsets per year, a billion of which must come from domestic sources. The value of these billion offsets will easily reach into the tens of billions. Because the cap is so broad, agriculture and forestry are the only areas where offsets can be applied. The result will be tens of billions of tax dollars flowing into the farm industry. As financial and auto industries have learned, federal money does not come without strings. Under the current bill, the EPA will be in charge of pulling these strings, and the EPA has no useful experience regulating agriculture. We've already got a whiff of what would happen if the EPA tries to regulate greenhouse gases. 
The American Farm Bureau Federation has said that if the EPA were to apply the Clean Air Act to greenhouse gases, nearly every dairy, cattle, and swine farm would fall under the regulations, resulting in literally a cow flatulence tax. The EPA has sworn this isn't their plan, but to exclude these farms from the regulations, the EPA would have to take steps to exempt them, steps that could be challenged in court. This is the kind of absurd regulation that is exactly the type of policy we could see if the EPA becomes too involved in regulating greenhouse gases and agriculture production. Republicans believe that any climate change legislation must meet four simple principles. It must protect jobs in the economy, produce tangible improvements to the environment, advance technological progress, and feature international participation, including that of China and India. If we keep these principles in mind, we can address climate without threatening American farmers or our economic health. And I thank the Chair. I thank the gentleman uh, very much. The Chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Uh, Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do appreciate your having the hearing at this time. I'm a little frustrated because I have two other hearings that are going on. I did want to uh, be here at least for the beginning and wanted to share some of uh, my uh, support for what you're doing uh, because there's nobody that has a greater stake in our getting our policies right with greenhouse gases more than agriculture. They are, have much at risk. We're seeing it in the Northwest. Uh, with declining snowpack, with changing uh, temperature patterns. Uh, if we don't get this right, uh, agriculture in, and forestry in the area that I represent uh, will be seriously at risk. Second, we have legislation that has been advanced uh, from uh, our friends on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which our distinguished chair has helped craft, uh, that can make a big difference for farmers, opportunities for our farms and forests to reduce global warming pollution, uh, for them to make money. Uh, as my good friend, the uh, ranking member, uh, pointed out, there are potentially billions of dollars available for American agriculture. Um, this is uh, an important opportunity. They also can earn uh, more money, and we're seeing this uh, in uh, my state. Uh, leasing their land for wind turbines, uh, a national renewable portfolio standard is going to develop that market even more, and thoughtful members of the agricultural community that I've been uh, d discussing are excited about it. Done right, there's an opportunity for cleaner fu fuels to come from forestry and agriculture, not questionable things where there's, it's not clear that that actually creates more energy and has dire uh, economic and environmental consequences, but we can get this right. Uh, we can provide a safety net to protect rural fa families from higher energy prices, and I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for the work that you've done in your other committee hat to do that. Uh, this is serious business. The notion that somehow there will not be regulation of agriculture, uh, not just for its greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but for other things that are consequences of massive family, uh, massive factory farms that put at risk American family agriculture um, is uh, a pipe dream. Um, we're seeing demands for more thoughtful regulation to protect people, uh, and we're seeing uh, uh, millions of people in urban areas having to spend massive amounts of money to deal with the consequences of not having appropriate environmental regulation. It is coming. This is part of a framework that can help them make money. Everybody's going to be better off. I appreciate what you're doing with this hearing Thank and you. look forward to working with you and other distinguished members of this panel who have uh, expertise to make sure that we get this right. Thank you. And thank you, gentlemen. The uh, chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would thank you and the ranking member for holding uh, this important hearing today on the impact of climate change on agriculture and forestry. Uh, as the at-large member for the state of South Dakota, predominantly rural state, uh, this issue is particularly important to my constituents. 
Moreover, the opportunities <coughs> for the agriculture and forestry sectors to participate in mitigating climate change uh, is equally an important topic. It's estimated that agriculture and forest lands currently sequester approximately 12% of our nation's carbon emissions. With proper proactive management te techniques, it's been estimated that the ag and forest sectors can sequester up to 25% of emissions. As such, the ag and forestry industries are essential partners in our efforts to mitigate climate change. Forests can both emit and sequester carbon, and through proper forest management, which includes thinning overstock stands, working to ensure diversity of types of ages of trees, and other steps, we can increase carbon sequestration. Uh, at the appropriate time, I'll look forward to introducing uh, one of my constituents on the panel today. Uh, but again, I thank the chairman for holding the hearing and yield back. Great. The, gen the gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Caught me a little unprepared here. Um, I am very interested in this hearing today, mainly because I am a farmer and uh, uh, my wife and I still farm 3,000 acres back in Colorado. So. I look forward to hearing uh, your testimony, and I want to thank the chairman for calling this important hearing. Thank you. Uh, while I have my concerns about uh, the cap and trade uh, bill that's coming up, um, I hope that we get it right. So thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Missouri is a part of the U.S. breadbasket and we produce in our state, uh, at least uh, generally, depending of course on, on weather conditions, about 382 million bushels of corn a year. And I am very proud to represent a district in a state uh, that is a leader in promoting alternative uh, energy uh, sources. Uh, in 2008, uh, my state, uh, Mr. Chairman, was the third state to begin implementing a renewal fuel standard requiring the sale of 10 percent uh, ethanol blends when ethanol is uh, cheaper than uh, fossil fuels. And uh, it is perhaps a little less known uh, that Missouri uh, places uh, outdoor recreation uh, up high in terms of uh, its annual production of uh, revenue. And uh, I think uh, at a time like this when recreation sometimes bumps heads with uh, agricultural desires and goals, <coughs> we've got to be uh, uh, very, very careful. Uh, and m my uh, concern is uh, that uh, global, global warming is, is real. It's, 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 it's no longer a political uh, issue. Uh, it is an issue uh, revolving around the survival of this planet as we know it. And uh, the more we can produce uh, renewables for fuel, uh, the better uh, off we will be. Uh, as I have said before, uh, we, this, this world in which we live went through a time when there were salt wars. People actually fought wars uh, over salt. Um, and then as we progressed and made salt less, uh, less valuable and alternatives uh, more viable, uh, we stopped having wars over salt. Uh, and refrigeration was a big uh, part of it. And I think the same thing can happen with uh, uh, renewables, alternative fuels, uh, that we can reduce uh, the need to have wars over oil, not that we've ever had one. Uh, but I thought I might just mention that. And uh, so I look forward to listening to our uh, uh, experts and uh, have some questions that I'd like to raise that would hopefully uh, help me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman very much. And now we're going to turn to our very distinguished panel. Um, each witness will be recognized for five minutes. At five minutes, I'm going to tap, begin to tap. You'll have 15 minutes, 15 seconds, rather, to conclude your statement after, uh, after that five-minute period when I tap, just uh, so I give you that notice in advance. Um, our first witness is Dr. Jerry Hatfield, um, supervisory plant 
physiologist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the lead author on the agriculture chapter in the Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States Report. Dr. Hatfield has had a distinguished scientific career authoring over 325 publications and serving as laboratory director of the uh, National uh, Soil Tilt um, uh, Laboratory. Uh, he has also served as the president of the American Society of Agronomy. So we thank you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. It is a pleasure to be able to present this information on climate impacts on agriculture to this committee. Agriculture is extremely sensitive to climate and weather, and resilience of our production systems to changes in climate occurs by understanding these impacts and their effects. It is also important to realize that U.S. agriculture is diverse and that simple general statements about the impacts of climate are not possible. Climate change is evidenced by rising temperatures, increasing precipitation and intensity of storms, rising carbon dioxide and ozone levels will impact agriculture. These changes are not consistent <clears throat> across the United States and may affect some agricultural areas more than others. The scenarios of climate change in the U.S. have implications for agriculture, which must be understood to protect the capability of food, feed, fiber, and fuel production and quality. One of the easier ways for us to understand the implications of agriculture or climate on agriculture is to consider the impacts of climate on animals. The increase in temperature and potential for more heat waves and extreme heat events will affect animal production. Animals respond to a combination of temperature and humidity in a similar fashion to humans. When it is hot and humid, we decrease our activity, reduce our food intake, and generally are less energetic than at other times. High temperature and humidity reduce the feed intake of animals, which in turn reduces the rate of meat, milk, or egg production. At the opposite end of the range, cold temperature extremes can reduce increased feed intake, but in the extra energy is consumed to keep the animals warm, which results in reduced growth or milk production. Extremes in hot or cold have negative impacts on animals, and heat waves can have serious consequences on animals and can create conditions in which there is increased death of animals in feedlots or barns. <clears throat> High temperature extremes will affect plants as well as animals, and of particular concern is the probability of heat waves or high temperature events at the pollination stage. Exposure of pollen to high temperatures can destroy the pollen and reduce the production of seed or fruit. Occurrences of heat waves at pollen time can have significant and negative impacts on plant production. Plants differ in their reaction to temperature. Cool season plants which are best suited to lower temperatures include many of the vegetables like peas or spinach. Warm season plants like watermelon, cotton, or cucumber thrive when the temperatures are warm. As temperature warms, this causes the plants to progress through their stage of development at a rate which does not allow for maximum expansion of leaves, stems, or fruits. One example of potential impacts of warming temperatures on crop yield has been found for soybean. As temperatures increase, Soybean yields in the southern U.S. are predicted to decrease by 3.5 percent, while in the Midwest they are projected to increase by 2.5 percent. Rising temperatures will exceed the optimum range for soybeans in the south while bringing soybean into the optimum range in the Midwest. Likewise, for many vegetables, warming temperatures will cause a reduction in production even more quickly because these are cool season crops. While many of the vegetables are growing during the winter in temperate climates, the length of this time in which this period of op is optimal will decrease. Increasing winter temperatures does increase the length of the growing season, and there are potential negative impacts on fruit trees, which requires a certain amount of cooling or chilling uh, in order to set fruit. Climate models and observations indicate that nighttime temperatures are rising faster than daytime temperatures. The shift in temperature patterns during the day has significant impacts on plants, particularly during the grain or fruit development periods. Warm temperatures at night increase the respiration rate, which reduces the amount of sugars and starches which can be stored in grain or fruit. This causes the fruit or grain size to be smaller and reduces the length of the grain filling period. Agriculture the quality of agricultural produce is not often thought of when we discuss climate change. However, there are many impacts of climate and weather on product quality. 
Variations in wine quality among years are related to subtle changes in weather at sensitive periods in the growing, in the growing season. And there are indirect and direct, or direct and indirect effects of climate on agriculture. Agriculture has and can adapt to a changing climate. The areas in which we grow certain plants demonstrates how we adapt plant production systems to the climate. This adaptation has been occurring in agriculture for centuries as farmers have selected the best crops for their regions, changed their cultural practices to cope with the risk from environmental stresses, and modified their practices to reduce the impacts of biological stresses caused by weeds, insects, or diseases. Research has been able to help speed this process for providing information to guide the decisions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Hatfield, very much. Our next uh, witness is Ms. Heather Cooley, Senior Researcher at the Pacific Institute. Ms. Cooley works with the Pacific Institute's water program, researching climate change, <coughs> water privatization, and California water issues. She has also studied uh, climate and land use change at the Lawrence uh, Berkeley Laboratory in California. We welcome you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to offer testimony reg regarding the effects of climate change on agriculture. As directed, I will limit my discussion here to those impacts related to water resources. Impacts on water resources will be especially problematic for agriculture. Numerous national and regional assessments, including the study released earlier this week, demonstrate that climate change is already affecting U.S. freshwater resources and that these impacts will intensify in the future. The U.S. Geological Survey regularly reports that agriculture uses 70 percent of the nation's freshwater resources. Thus, impacts on water resources will have major consequences for agriculture. Rain-fed agriculture is especially vulnerable to changing precipitation patterns. In response to these changes, farmers may shift to supplemental irrigation, which may increase tensions over limited water resources. We're already seeing this in some areas. For example, in Georgia's Flint River Basin, farmers are rapidly shifting from rain-fed to irrigated agriculture. And this shift is one of the factors fueling the ongoing tensions between Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. Surface water supplies will be increasingly out of phase with agricultural water demand. Surface runoff is expected to, de to decline during summer months at precisely the, the time when agricultural water demand peaks. Floods and droughts will become more common and more severe. And these extreme events will have a greater effect on crop production than changes in average conditions. Losses from droughts already total six to eight billion dollars annually, much of which is due to impacts on agriculture, and these losses could rise in the future. Many of the impacts of climate change are now unavoidable. In fact, they are already occurring. The good news is that adaptation can substantially reduce the risk of climate change for the agricultural sector, but we cannot be complacent. The time to act is now. In the time available, I will offer a set of recommendations to reduce agriculture's vulnerability to changes in water resources. First, we must improve the management of surface resources. Specifically, the Bureau of Reclamation and Army Corps of Engineers should adopt new rules for the operation of water infrastructure in light of climate change. And based on these experiences and the methodologies they develop, the Bureau and Corps should provide guidance and oversight to local and state agencies to do similar analyses. We must also improve groundwater management. Our dependence on groundwater may increase in the future in response to more frequent and severe droughts. Throughout much of the United States, however, groundwater basins are mismanaged and overdrafted. In particular, the federal government should require all states to design and implement comprehensive groundwater monitoring and management programs. We must also capture water conservation and efficiency potential. Reducing agricultural water use reduces vulnerability to drought. However, many conservation practices require substantial investment. To help defray these initial costs, the government should expand funding for water conservation and efficiency within the federal farm bill. In addition, we should provide tax exemptions or rebates for efficient irrigation equipment and infrastructure. 
We must also eliminate federal policies that inadvertently increase vulnerability to climate change. For example, the Farm Bill provides substantial direct impayments for water-intensive crops that may not be appropriate under future climate conditions and may ultimately increase vulnerability to climate change. In its place, we should support new policies that promote climate change adaptation. Specifically, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program provides cost shares for practices that promote agricultural production and environmental quality. EQIP, however, accounts for less than 1% of the overall budget, and Congress has threatened to reduce funding further. The federal government should expand funding for Farm Bill Conservation Programs, especially EQIP. We must also continue research and development. Although climate change is a global problem, its impacts are local. Accordingly, detailed assessments of climate change risks require thorough analysis at the regional level. Without significant investment to generate estimates of regional impacts, climate change will remain a vague and unwieldy threat. The information must then be communicated to the agricultural community. Farmers and local communities will ultimately be responsible for implementing adaptation strategies, and the information that is available has not been adequately conveyed to farmers. Additional outreach is best accomplished by building on existing relationships. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, in consultation with NRCS and Extension agents, should develop trainings and provide guidance about climate change impacts and ad adaptation strategies for the agricultural sector. We know that climate change is already occurring and that our farms are on the front lines. The challenge is to quickly equip the most vulnerable sectors and communities with tools to plan for and adapt to unavoidable impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooley. Uh, it is uh, now a great pleasure of mine to be able to introduce the next witness uh, to members of the select committee. He is a fellow South Dakotan and a friend, Mr. Tom Troxel. Uh, Tom is the director of the Black Hills Forest Resource Association. Uh, Mr. Troxel brings a deep understanding of forestry and the forest industry gl gleaned from over three decades of experience as a forester, working with the forest product companies in South Dakota and Wyoming uh, and for about 10 years, uh, or longer than that, but 10 years in the U.S. Forest Service uh, before then. He's been an invaluable resource to my office on issues related directly to the Black Hills National Forest and forest practices and policies more generally. His expertise is well known at home, uh, but also recognized and respected nationally. On a personal level, I'd like to publicly thank Tom for sharing his advice and counsel with me for many years now, and I strongly commend his testimony to my colleagues today. Mr. Troxel, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Representative Herseth. Sandlin and members of the committee for this opportunity to discuss climate change and forest. Many climate experts are predicting a warmer, drier climate in the coniferous forests of the western United States. If correct, based on the last decade of drought conditions over much of the west, our forests will be increasingly susceptible to insect epidemics and forest fires, both of which have significant effects on air quality, water quality, stream flows, wildlife habitat, infrastructure, recreation and rural communities. Sustainable management of forests can to a substantial degree mitigate global climate change and there appears to be substantial overlap between climate change goals and proper forest management. Forests are unique in that no other means of sequestering or offsetting carbon has the added benefits of providing clean air, clean water, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, aesthetics and wood products. Federal policies that invite and encourage sustainable use of our nation's forests can help produce low carbon energy and sequester carbon through management strategies for sequestration, reducing fires and insect epidemics, substitution of biomass for fossil fuels, and utilization of wood products. Forests can either be a sink or a carbon source. A carefully managed forest can both prevent and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Emphasis must be placed on maintaining forest health by thinning overstock stands to reduce the risk of insect epidemics and wildfires. When catastrophic events do occur, dead trees should be salvaged, the area regenerated to restore forest cover and allow young trees to start absorbing carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Emissions of greenhouse gases can be reduced through the substitution of biomass for fossil fuels to produce heat, electricity, and transportation fuels. 
The congressional definition of renewable biomass in the RES is critical for cogeneration plants to be financially feasible. Forest biomass from federal lands must be eligible, and all sustainably managed forest, public or private, should be equally eligible to supply biomass. I'd like to show several slides. If we can have the slides, please. Uh, I'm going to go through these quickly in the interest of time. This is the result of a mountain pine beetle epidemic in the Black Hills. These dead trees are a carbon source and a fire risk. Next slide. This is a mountain pine beetle epidemic in Colorado. These dead trees are also a carbon source and fire risk. All the stands in this entire landscape are lodgepole pine. They're the same age and they're overstocked. This was a mountain pine beetle epidemic waiting to happen, and increased temperatures pulled the trigger. Next slide. This is the smoke column from the Jasper fire in the Black Hills. Fires are a huge source of greenhouse gases and particulates. Next slide. This is the Jasper fire area. It's now a carbon source as the trees decay. There's a risk of reburn, and the burned area needs reforestation to restart the sequestration cycle. Next slide. This is an unthinned stand of ponderosa pine in the Black Hills. A stand like this is very susceptible to fires and forest insects. Next slide. This is a thin stand of ponderosa pine in the Black Hills. This is a healthy stand with low susceptibility to fires and insects. This is a carbon sequestration factory. There is strong public support for thinning like this in the Black Hills because residents understand the link between overstock forest and fires and mountain pine beetles. Next slide. This is a slash pile that the Forest Service burns thousands of these each year. These are a source of greenhouse gases and particulates. These should, but do not, meet the RES definition of renewable biomass. Next slide. My last slide is a picture of the case number one area. This is the site in the Black Hills National Forest where the first timber sale from the entire national forest system was sold in 1899. This area has been thinned and harvested several times since 1899. Since then, approximately six billion board feet have been harvested from the Black Hills National Forest. And at the same time, the standing volume has increased from about one and a half billion board feet to almost six billion board feet. Sustainable forest management really does work. It, including forestry in the climate change equation offers an opportunity to have our cake and eat it too. We can make our forest healthier, reduce the risk of wildfires and insects, better utilize slash and small trees, create new jobs in rural communities, and produce renewable energy from American resources. In conclusion, thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. I appreciate your time and attention, and I offer my full assistance to the committee, to Chairman Markey, and also to you, Representative Herseth Sandlin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Troxell. Our next witness uh, joining us today is Mr. Ford West. He's president of the Fertilizer Institute. Mr. West brings 30 years of experience with the Fertilizer Institute representing the association before Congress, federal agencies, and the media. Uh, we thank you for being here today, Mr. West, uh, and you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, fertilizer industry supplies nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphate, and potash to farmers who grow food for America's dinner table. Uh, fertilizer is a strategic commodity in food production because 40 to 60 percent of the world's food supply is tied to the use of fertilizers. Now, all sectors of our industry will be impacted by climate change policy, but I'm going to focus on the nitrogen sector this morning, which is most vulnerable to the impacts of a cap and trade system. And it's our goal at the end of the day, if Congress passes cap and trade, that will not place our industry in a serious competitive disadvantage compared to our global fertilizer producers that we compete with, such as China, Russia, Venezuela and will not force the domestic fertilizer industry overseas to countries with no carbon reduction policies. The nitrogen industry uses natural gas as a feedstock or an input required to make nitrogen. We use natural gas as an ingredient in a fixed chemical process that combines nitrogen from the air, 
hydrogen from natural gas to produce uh, nitrogen fertilizer, ammonia, and we produce CO2. And outside of changing the laws of chemistry, there's nothing we can do to change this process. And 90 percent of the cost of producing a ton of ammonia is uh, tied directly to the price of natural gas. And so this makes the nitrogen industry one of the most energy intensive, greenhouse gas intensive, and trade intensive sectors of our economy. Now the industry's worked hard to be as energy efficient as we can. Uh, we've cut the amount of natural gas used to produce a, a ton of ammonia by 11 percent. Uh, not only does that save energy, but it also reduces CO2 emissions, and US EPA estimates that we've cut about four and a half million tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per year out of our production process. We want to be more efficient, but the chemical nature of our process limits our uh, uh, ability to find much more efficiency gains in our production process. One of our big concerns here is fuel switching. Uh, we don't have a very good history with fuel switching. When Congress repealed the Fuel Use Act in 1987, and, and allowed utilities to burn natural gas to produce electricity. As the utilities uh, began that process and went from zero to about 20 percent of our electricity uh, produced by burning natural gas, the price of natural gas went from like two dollars to about eight, and we shut down 26 uh, uh, nitrogen plants in that process. We were the, uh, the poster child of leakage in that public policy. And, and, and that's a challenge we have. Currently, we have 29 nitrogen plants operating in the U.S. We import about 55 percent of our nitrogen, and 82 percent of that nitrogen come from countries that are not necessarily eager to regulate carbon and reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, so I hope you can understand that uh, uh, we have some concerns with our remaining domestic nitrogen uh, production uh, as the utilities, again, will turn to natural gas as an alternative to generate electricity. And I know that we're trying to go to solar and wind to produce electricity, but the backup when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing is natural gas. So it's important to understand that uh, fertilizer is a global commodity traded in the world market. Uh, we are not only having to compete against those countries uh, that, are, that uh, are not interested in right now in climate change policy, but we also got to be concerned with those governments who are uh, signed on to Kyoto, who are looking for ways to protect their energy intensive industries, and we just hope that this American policy that we develop on cap and trade doesn't cause us more plant closure and raise the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, imported nitrogen that we have. Uh, the average uh, nitrogen plant that we have today employs 100 50 to 200 people. Uh, these are good jobs. The average salary is about 75,000. They're located in rural uh, communities. They're good jobs, good benefits, and these facilities give a great deal back uh, to the communities. Uh, I think you can see about the price of energy is a major concern in agriculture. Uh, we did ask the Doan Advisory Service to do an analysis of uh, energy cost and what that may mean to farmers. It's somewhere around six to twelve billion dollars based on the Lieberman Memorial Bill. And that's why you find agriculture so concerned about having an offset program that they could participate in to help recover some of their costs. We are very supportive of that. We've been working with fertilizer best management practices in Alberta, uh, the province of Alberta, to develop a, uh, a, a, a protocol based on, based on the 4R nutrient stewardship system. And we think the best management practices have a potential to not only increase ag yields, as we are called on to increase agricultural production of 50 uh, percent by 2025 and double it by 2050, but we can also enhance fertilizer use, significantly reduce emissions of greenhouse gas, and improve our water quality. And I thank you and look forward to your question. Thank you, Mr. West. Uh, our next witness is Dr. Johannes Lehman. Associate Professor of Soil Fertility Management and Soil Biogeochemistry at Cornell University and the world's expert on biochar. Uh, Dr. Lehman has conducted research around the world, recently studying nutrient and carbon management in the central Amazon for the Federal Research Institution of Forestry. Uh, Dr. Lehman, welcome to the Select Committee. You're now recognized.
Sir, could you make sure your microphone is, yeah, let's try that. Is it? Is it working now? Yeah. Uh, through this so-called pyrolysis, biomass can be transformed from materials that are subject to rapid decomposition to a material that decomposes much more slowly, thereby creating a long-term carbon sink. Such thermally altered material is about one and a half to two orders of magnitude more stable in soils than uncharred organic matter, thus creating soil carbon pools with a mean residence time of several hundreds to thousands of years. Biochar production and its application to soil provides several additional important value streams beyond direct climate change mitigation. S these include waste management, energy production, and soil improvement. Biochar can be produced from a variety of feedstocks that would otherwise constitute a financial or environmental liability. Examples include animal manures in agricultural regions with high phosphorus and nitrogen loadings, green wastes that may gener generate nitrous oxide or methane during landfill, or biomass from forest thinning for fire prevention. The second value stream arises from the bioenergy generated during biochar production. Between 10, 2 and 7 units of energy can be produced for each unit of energy invested during the life cycle of various biochar systems. The third value stream is the improvement of soil quality upon biochar additions. Crop yields in many less productive soils can be significantly increased and losses of agrochemicals such as fertilizer nutrients, herbicides and pesticides can be decreased. Taken together, these three sources of value can enhance food and energy security while also combating climate change. Deliberate biochar additions to soils have a number of implications for carbon trading. Additionality can be demonstrated because biochar is currently not added to soil to any appreciable extent. Monitoring of biochar sequestration is facilitated by the fact that we can easily record the carbon that is added at any time. And its sequestration, it, the impact does not need to develop over time. Verification of sequestration is possible because biochars bear a chemical signature that can be distinguished from other organic matter in soil. The national or global potential of biochar to help mitigate climate change is only theoretical at this point because too few biochar systems exist at scale of implementation. Conservative modeling of the technical potential place biochar as an approach to contribute on the order of one gigaton carbon removals annually by 2050. Such widespread adoption of biochar systems will require sustainability criteria. Biochar must therefore be integrated into existing food production systems and not be an alternative to food production. Make use of already developed best management practices such as conservation agriculture and build on residue collection systems that are already in place. While few fully implemented modern biochar ex systems exist worldwide, the necessary engineering and science capacity is available to evaluate a diverse set of biochar systems at scale of implementation in the near term. In fact, biochar science has rapidly evolved even over the past 12 months. Evaluation does not rely on a fundamental advance in science, but on application and adaptation of existing science. The underlying technology is robust and sufficiently simple to make it applicable to many regions globally. Current hurdles to implementation are availability of pyrolysis units at sufficient maturity to allow all necessary research and development, and as a direct consequence, a lack of demonstrated carbon trading activities, of sufficient development of best biochar practices, and of demonstration of soil health benefits for the full spectrum of agroecosystems. The distributed nature of biochar systems and the potential for variability um, between systems create significant opportunities for sustainability, but also hurdles to widespread adoption, regulation, and financial viability. Establishment of policies at national and international levels is required to remove hurdles to implementation and support full evaluation of biochar systems. Mechanisms for carbon trading need to be put into place that recognize biochar soil carbon sequestration. Methodologies must include full life cycle accounting of emission balances to deliver net climate benefits. The entire value chain of mitigation approaches must be recognized to reward those activities that have multiple environmental and societal benefits. Biochar must not be an alternative to making dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions immediately, but it may be an important tool in our arsenal for combating dangerous climate change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Dr. Lehman. I thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and start out the first set of questions. And Mr. Troxla, I want to spend a few minutes focusing on your testimony regarding the substitution of biomass for fossil fuels to produce heat, electricity, and transportation fuels. Uh, if you could uh, discuss what impact the federal definition of renewable biomass in the renewable electricity standard and the renewable fuels standard uh, has on developing wood-based sources of energy, and how would including woody biomass from federal lands in the RFS and RES impact federal forest land management? Th thank you, Representative Perseus Sandlin. The, the definition of renewable biomass in, in both the RFS and RES would make a great deal of difference in the financial feasibility of plants that would either produce electricity or cellulosic ethanol because of the financial incentives that, that are associated with both of those pieces of legislation. In, in the case of the RFS definition of renewable biomass, woody biomass from the national forest was completely excluded. Um, most of the forest in the Black Hills are federal Black Hills National Forest, and, and so th that whole stream of biomass is, is taken off the table. In, in the current version of the RES, um, th there, there are really three components of woody biomass that would go into any of those type facilities. There's mill residues, there's slash from the slash piles like we saw the picture of, and there are pre-commercial thinnings. Um, the, the, in the RES definition, the mill residues would be included, but the way I read and understand the definition is the, the pre-commercial thinnings and the slash piles would be excluded from the renewable biomass because of, of a specific phrase that excludes timber from mature forest stands. And, and that's a, um, a, a term, it's, it's a fairly generic term, there's not a definition for it. I, I think it's open to d debate or challenge, and, and especially when we get into the, the federal process uh, of uh, making decisions that could be subject to appeal or litigation, and it just opens a, a lot of uncertainty. The, the other part of the, the current RES definition that's problematic is the, the, the requirement that it be harvested in environmentally sustainable quantities as determined by the appropriate federal land manager. As foresters, I, I'm, I'm completely supportive of sustainable uh, quantities and, and management, but I don't know, and, and this is open to speculation about what the process would be to make that determination and, and what kind of analysis or decision would be required to get there. Thank you, Mr. Troxell. Um, as uh, you may know, uh, we are deep in negotiations uh, as it relates to altering uh, the definition that currently exists in the uh, bill that was marked up in the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, and we hope to be able to make uh, the changes that you suggest so that we are able to uh, utilize uh, pre-commercial thinnings and other woody biomass through current forest management practices uh, on federal forests. But would you like to speak for a minute or two about the importance of how this affects private uh, forest owners as well? The, um, m most of the timberlands in the Black Hills are, are, are federal. I, I think it's important, though, to include private timberlands and make sure that those private landowners do have a chance to contribute toward um, production of renewable energy, um, and, and I would encourage you, you to continue your efforts to uh, make sure that that definition does uh, adequately include both private and federal lands. Thank you, Mr. Troxell. Um, I will uh, reserve uh, some of my other questions for the second round of questioning and would now recognize the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for taking the time to be with us today. We all appreciate it. I'm sorry that I was late to the hearing, but as you have learned probably from others today, we have three hearings. Uh, Energy and Commerce has uh, three hearings that are going on, and of course, uh, trying to step into those and then be here is... Um, 
get tricky, but uh, we have the opportunity to make them all and appreciate it. Agriculture is a very vital part of the economy in Tennessee, which is where my district is found. And we are hearing quite a bit about the Waxman-Markey bill and the effect that's going to have on agriculture. And Madam Chairman, I have two pages that one of our constituents sent over. These are just ag facts. I would love to submit those into the record for this hearing if that's Without possible. Without objection, so entered. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is all about agriculture in Tennessee, and it's $44 billion of our state's economy. We have, that's 11 percent of our state's economy, and we have 79,000 farms that are employing more than 300,000 people in our state, and over 40 percent of our state is actually farmland. So the issues that we're discussing today are of vital importance to us on so many different levels. And as I said, people are very concerned about what Waxman Markey is going to do to their livelihood, their ability to earn a livelihood. The estimates that have come out so far is that the farmer's net income would decrease by $23 billion annually over the next 25 years. And we've got a lot of farmers that live off that income. And also the increase in construction cost of farm buildings and equipment is expected to be a 5 to 10 percent increase added to whatever the inflationary rate is. So when you look at what the farmers are up against with the cost of buildings and construction and equipment and maintenance, and then you get into actually uh, dealing with the crop itself, and Mr. West fertilizer is a big part of that. And when I am in West Tennessee and we're talking about not only the row crops but the soybeans and the cotton, um, fertilizer is a, a huge component of that, and what I would like to hear from you, what my constituents are asking from, from me, if cap and trade, if uh, Waxman Markey is passed into law, what is it going to do to the fertilizer industry? What is it going to do to your prices? And equally as important, what is it going to do to the availability of the product, and you touched on nitrogen, and you touched on uh, the offshore competition, and I'd like for you to drill down on that just a little bit. Well, I think availability. I think the issue for us is availability. Okay. Um, because we see the price of natural gas going up, and that'll affect agriculture across the board. Every three dollar increase in natural gas is a billion dollars to our industry. That's how much gas we use in producing ammonia. And so the question becomes, are we going to produce a nitrogen fertilizer, for example, in the United States, or are we going to import uh, the majority of our uh, nitrogen fertilizer? Now, when we, now we import 55 percent today, so we don't set the price of nitrogen fertilizer in the United States, it's set in the world market. And uh, a year ago, the demand for fertilizer around the world as we had a food scare. And as you know, we had a big conference in Rome in June of last year about scarcity of food. We had countries around the world hoarding food. We had countries hoarding fertilizer, keeping it off the world market. Price of fertilizer went off the charts. Uh, and uh, of course, the worldwide drop in economy has changed that and the prices have come down. But if we raise our input costs, world price of fertilizer uh, uh, stays the same, uh, we'll shut down our production okay. facilities. I don't want to interrupt you there, but I do have one other question I want to go to before my time expires. So Dr. Hatfield, you mentioned that um, some of the studies show that the optimum range of temperature for the crop harvest actually increases as CO2 in the atmosphere increases. So very quickly, how do you see this affecting our southern states like Tennessee? I don't know that we made a statement that said that, would you repeat that? That, that the optimum range of temperature for crop har and harvest increase as CO2 in the atmosphere increases. 
Well, actually, there are two different processes that are going on. Uh, okay. Temperature requirements for plants uh, is really not linked to the CO2. Uh, if we said that, that's a misinterpretation. Okay. Um, the, the temperature plays a real role, and, and, and CO2 is really that basic building block in terms of taking CO2 from the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis that grows that. It is temperature mediated. Uh, and when one of the pieces that occurs in this is not the photosynthetic process, but actually the respiration process uh, that is affected as well, which is influenced by temperature. Okay, thank you for that. And my time has expired. I will yield back. I uh, thank the gentlewoman. I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Troxell, about 50 years ago, there was a severe infect. Uh, insect infestation across the West and some of the forests. We find that same problem here today. It's uh, significant in Colorado. You've seen many of the forests. The pictures you showed today were uh, quite telling. Many people um, actually blame climate change for being the sole factor. Uh, I mean, this thing has happened. It's kind of cyclical. It's happened in the past. Uh, could you comment on that? Thank you, Representative Salazar. I, I believe the underlying problem is, is the condition of the forest. And, and as I described the, the picture in Colorado, it, it's a single species, they're all the same age, and they're in overstock stands. And it seems like this is one of those cases that we have to keep relearning the same lessons. And managing a forest is a lot like managing a stock portfolio. D diversity is good. Um, our, our forests in Colorado, our lodgepole pine forests, are, are roughly the equivalent of having an entire stock portfolio in Enron several years ago. And, and when, when it goes south, it, it all goes south. And that's, that's what's happened to our forest. L looking ahead, what we need to do is concentrate on diversity of age classes, diversity of species, and keeping those stands thinned and vigorous and healthy. Um, going forward so that they are better able to, to resist and, and withstand um, stress and uh, not be as susceptible to fires and insect epidemics. Well, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lehman, to a layman like myself, explain biochar. I don't understand it. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Um, uh, biochar is is uh, very much like charcoal um, in the sense that um, the, uh, uh, the organic structures change entirely when you heat biomass, for instance, a wood log. Um, you cover it um, uh, in modern pyrolysis units. Uh, this is achieved in, uh, in so-called reactors uh, where air is ex excluded uh, from, the, from the process. Um, and the biomass is heated uh, to about 300 to 600 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, the properties of the biomass change uh, and they form so-called charcoal. Charcoal is a substance that has been produced um, throughout the history of humanity uh, at all stages uh, and has been one of the, mo uh, the earliest industrial processes. Um, uh, so the process is very, very similar, identical almost as producing charcoal. What it, um, differs is that uh, biochar is produced for uh, the purpose of soil amendment. Uh, and that means uh, s several charcoals may make good biochars, but there have been found to be a lot of different biochars made from feedstocks that would not make a very good fuel, uh, which is what we usually produce charcoal for. Um, and, and this biochar material um, has remarkable properties that enhance soil fertility, soil quality. Uh, it is like a sponge, it is like a, um, a, a substrate where nutrients called, can, can hold on to, uh, where microorganisms find a habitat, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's also been dubbed as a microbial reef uh, in soil. Um, the chemical changes that happen through this uh, thermal, so-called thermal decomposition, this thermal treatment, is so profound that uh, the uh, uh, stability of the organic matter uh, is um, dramatically increased. Uh, what was a leaf or a grass that would have decomposed 
within a few days or weeks or months uh, is now a charred leaf that uh, is uh, stable for uh, many decades, hundreds of years, even thousands of years. So is it like a sponge then, for example, if you apply nitrogen fertilizer to the soil, will that actually hold uh, the nutrient and release it as a plant needs it? Yes, um, very similar um, uh, to, we, we are all very familiar with the, with the uh, uh, value of soil organic matter. Uh, every farmer, every gardener will uh, agree that uh, when we increase soil organic matter, uh, we hold nutrients in the soil, we improve soil gr uh, plant growth uh, um, um, ability. Uh, and, and very much the same is happening with, with biochar. The interesting aspect is that biochar is more effective in providing these attributes, um, these desirable attributes of soil organic matter than, for instance, other uh, organic material because it's more stable and it has a higher surface area. Uh, it has a certain structure that makes, uh, provides this ability. Thank you, my time's expired. Thank you, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Spire. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Lehman, let me um, ask you, you know, there's great exciting news coming from companies like yours that suggest that if we pursue biofuels, we're going to see a reduction in greenhouse gases of some 70 percent. I have a company in my district called Solarzyme that is using uh, algae to produce aviation fuel right now and has the potential of producing it for cars as well. Its big problem, and I'm wondering if it's yours as well, is the fact that it needs to gear up. It, it needs the resources to be able to create a large facility so that it can, in fact, produce the products in large volumes. Uh, I guess my question to you is, um, what do you recommend that Congress do to focus on the technical and economic challenges that uh, many of you are facing in your efforts to scale up? Uh, thank you, Ms. Freer, for the question. Um, just uh, for, the, for the record, I'm not a uh, representative of a, of a company, but um, I'm a university professor and have no, no company affiliations. Um, I, um, um, you, you're asking about the, uh, the, the fuel production uh, ability of bio, uh, in, in the bioenergy stream uh, using pyrolysis. Um, and uh, that is correct, pyrolysis uh, is um, able to generate fuels and so are other bioenergy streams that you mentioned, uh, fermentation, um, even combustion. Um, bioenergy uh, as a whole um, needs, to, uh, needs to deliver net climate and net uh, environmental benefits. Um, and, and we need to look at the full life cycle impact, uh, both economically as well as um, from a carbon footprint point of view. Um, that, that, I think we have her learned the hard lesson uh, with, uh, with the uh, current ethanol debate. Um, bio biomass in itself um, is, a, in, in many instances, a commodity that is uh, distributed in the landscape. Um, and that means that uh, when they need to be gathered, uh, carbon needs to be invested to, to achieve that. It's a handling issue. Um, it's a storage issue. Um, and uh, so we need to look hard at those opportunity, uh, opportunities where we can um, uh, harness the most environmental and climate benefits. Uh, and and uh, colleague, uh, colleague Truxley has uh, already uh, showed us a few examples where um, biomass actually constitutes, or biomass burning, um, the decomposition and uh, dieback of forests constitute an environmental uh, and economic liability. Um, these are opportunities that can be uh, harnessed uh, first. Um, uh, there needs to be very judicious uh, discussion and a very judicious um, uh, observation of, of uh, biomass, bioenergy to, to uh, be uh, sure to uh, develop uh, net climate and net economic benefits. Thank you. Let me further ask you, you know, we make the mistake from time to time of picking winners and losers, whether it's in health or in this case, uh, choosing ethanol over, you know, other p potential um, alternative fuels and finding out that, in fact, there are huge um, repercussions. 
do you have any recommendations to us on how we go about being um, somewhat more neutral in allowing those that are in the area of producing new alternatives to be able to do so in a way that doesn't create a winner or a loser and yet also gives the opportunity for um, the entities that are out there to, to gear up? Um, that's a very good question and uh, um, uh, it is indeed important to not uh, pick winners or losers because there will likely be opportunities for many different um, avenues and, and they need to be geared to the local conditions. Um, and and what, it, what is worse, probably they will change over time, even during the course of the year, uh, which uh, biomass streams are available. Um, so we need to look at, at integrated concepts of bioenergy. Um, and, and there are initiatives that are underway by companies as well as by academic institutions and research organizations to look at bioenergy as an integrated concept, not as just uh, a, 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 a one-side track um, for, uh, for dealing with biomass. Um, and uh, and, and that, is, that is very important. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlewoman. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you, Mr. West. I, I, I've read your testimony. I'm sorry I didn't get to, to hear it, uh, but I have read your testimony. I want to ask a couple questions about this important subject. Um, in the underlying uh, text of the bill that's passed the Commerce Committee, we have a provision that was called the Doyle Inslee Amendment that has free allowances to trade sensitive energy intensive industries. And it's my understanding that the fertilizer industry would qualify for that, both as trade sensitive and energy um, intensive. Is, is that your understanding? That's my understanding. Yes, and thank you for doing that and putting it in there. <laughs> I appreciate that. How would, you, how would you quantify the benefits to the industry in that regard? Have you put a dollar figure on it or a percentage of costs? Or well, uh, we are subject uh, to those free allowances. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, 15% uh, of the total allowances set aside, uh, set aside for energy intensive industries. We're probably one of what, 45, 50 sectors that would be eligible for that. Uh, right now, I don't know exactly how many uh, allowances we're going to be able to receive from that because, you know, we've got to go through the rulemaking and the EPA and everybody report. Uh, my gut tells me that there's probably not enough in there. And, uh, you know, so you, because, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see the nitrogenous sector with a set amount so that we could plan a little bit more about our, uh, what that means to us and can we survive in the global economy over, let's say, the 10 years uh, that that's going to be available. Uh, when Mr. Doyle and I were doing this, we, you know, we, we wanted to, to be fairly aggressive in, in protecting these sectors, and, and I think it's a pretty good slug of allowances that we've come up with, but your concern is that your natural gas increases would would be larger than the value of those allowances. That's, that's sort of that's your correct. concern. That's uh, correct. Your provision deals with, as you know, direct and indirect cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we've got this big old boogeyman out here of what's the cost of natural gas. Right. Three dollars and a half today. Uh, we seem to have a lot of natural gas, but everybody seems to be turning to natural gas, and natural gas is the environmental fuel of choice. And uh, if we don't get this right, our allowances will be eaten up by the price of natural gas, and we won't be competitive in, in the world market. The, uh, the EPA, I'm told, and I haven't read this in detail, but I'm told that the EPA did an assessment of this and found that uh, there really wouldn't, they didn't feel would be natural gas price spikes associated with this um, that you fear. Have you looked at their, have you looked at their assessment? Uh, uh, I don't know if I've looked at their assessment, but natural gas has spiked above $10 three times since 2000. So uh, it's going to be very difficult not to put uh, with the demand for natural gas that natural gas prices will not increase as everybody well, turns to it. I'm told that their assessment suggested that uh, I'm not saying there won't be spikes in natural gas, and they're not saying that either. It's spiked without this bill. There's been big spikes Absolutely. in natural gas without this legislation, of course. 
The question is what this legislation would do. And my understanding of their conclusion is, is that the combination of the free allowances, the fact that we've got considerable natural gas supplies still subject to development, the fact that we've got significant efficiencies we're all still working on, the fact that there are, there are other alternatives besides natural gas that is not the only one, they've concluded that they didn't see a probability we're all dealing, you describe it as the boogeyman, maybe that's the right way to look at it. It's, we deal with possibilities and probabilities here, but they felt that the probability was that we wouldn't experience that. And I just, if you have any critiques of that assessment, send it by, we'd, we'd love to see it. Um, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, we have less than five minutes remaining in a very long series of votes. Uh, if this were a normal series of votes, we would, uh, recess for a period of time and come back for additional questions uh, that I and others uh, have, but there are at least 28 votes in this series. And so uh, I would encourage uh, my colleagues to submit any additional questions that they have for the record. Uh, I have a series as it relates to uh, incentives and tools for agriculture to employ, to adapt, and what HR 2454, uh, how it addresses uh, those incentives or tools, as well as uh, sufficiently robust offsets program that Mr. West explained, uh, but I want to emphasize to our panelists today the importance of your testimony. As I stated previously, uh, negotiations are intense and ongoing as it relates to possible changes to the draft that was marked up under the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. And uh, the upcoming days and, and possibly a few extra weeks are immensely important. And the issue of agriculture and forestry is a primary focus of those negotiations. So we appreciate your testimony. We will submit our questions uh, to you in writing uh, and hope that you will have uh, time to get back to us uh, uh, as quickly as possible uh, based on the impact that your responses could have uh, for those negotiations that are ongoing. So I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses today, thank my colleagues for their participation, uh, and uh, the hearing now stands adjourned.